Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. November 1990, Rygate, Surrey. Like a scene from a movie, gunmen ambush a Securicor van carrying large amounts of money. But the police are one step ahead and about to crack the biggest South London crime family since the Richardsons. In the 20s, a different family was controlling the streets of South London. One of them, the so-called queen, Alice Diamond, was about to lose control and bring about her downfall. Her gang of 40 thieves was the biggest shoplifting network Britain had ever seen. In this programme, we're going to be looking at two gangs, both from different eras, but both fighting over the same piece of South London turf. We'll be looking at one of the oldest and longest-running gangs of all time to see why they were so successful. And what happened to that same South London turf after the 60s, and how the gangs there have remained in competition ever since. We've all heard the stories of the Craze and the Richardsons, gangs who ran the streets of London in the 50s and 60s. But who came next? Who filled the void? One gang who came to prominence were certain members of a Turkish Cypriot family from South East London. They were four brothers, Bakir, Mehmet, Dennis and Dogen, known as the Kings of the Old Kent Road, and their name, the Arifs. I'm meeting up with crime writer and historian Wensley Clarkson. I want to find out who the Arifs took over from in South London. Where we're sitting today, this used to be a Richardson area. This was all the Richardson Manor, um, right the way up to the Thames. I mean, they really ruled it. Yeah, every pub along the Old Kent Road and in the back streets, um, they had a, a say in how it was run. Yeah. Uh, there were a wonderful array of drinking clubs, spielers, if you go back even further to the late 50s, early 60s. Uh, and the Richardsons used that network of of pubs to gain a lot of power in the area and that was the key to the power when it came to families especially in the 60s but I think as far as the the Richardsons were concerned they thought they were kings of the world the, as far as they were concerned south of the river was theirs no one could touch them they'd have a you know, few little crossovers with the craze did they ever come down here the craze? Well, the craze occasionally did come down here and then he was bedlam there was a, a shootout at Mr Smith's yeah. that was partly connected to to the craze and there were other uh, small pockets of trouble. But overall, the demarcation line, which was the river, was abided by. The Crays were up here in North London. The Richardsons down here in the south. And when they'd gone, we had the Arifs. After the Richardsons were imprisoned, there was a void. There were no immediate successors. The Richardsons weren't old enough to have children who were adults. Other families held back for whatever reason, I don't know. But that pocket, that void, enabled a number of much more ruthless criminals to come onto the scene, particularly the four brothers who'd come over to South London from northern Cyprus during the 60s and early 70s, and they were determined to make their mark. This used to be their patch. They brought up pubs, clubs and restaurants. Between them, they also made their money from armed robberies and drug trafficking. 
they had amazing contacts in Turkey, which was part of the heroin trail from India. How else did they make money then? Besides heroin, some of the Arabs stepped into the robbery game with a vengeance. To begin with, they worked with some of the likely lads who actually came, were born and bred in South London, classic criminals, some of whom were related to or friends of the great train robbers. And some of the Arabs, they started to hit uh, money in transit. In other words, money that was being transferred from banks. They shocked a lot of the old time villains here because of the nature of the way they went about their business. Despite their new criminal status, the Arif brothers began modestly. After running a cafe off the depth of Broadway, they went on to amass a string of legitimate businesses, such as jewelers, pubs, bodybuilding gyms, and a nightclub called the Connoisseur on the Old Kent Road. Through their crimes, they made so much money that many years later, in 1990, the Arifs held a wedding reception at the Savoy, costing £30,000. Many of the other crime families attended. By this time, the Arif brothers were thought to be the single most powerful criminal gang in South London. But if you go back 70 years to the 1920s, the area around Elephant Castle was the turf of another gang the Elephant Boys. By the 1920s, the Elephant and Castle Gang, the Elephant Boys, or just the Elephant, were already 100 years old. Their members were smash and grab artists, burglars, fences, and thugs. They were dapper and intelligent, and regarded with a grudging respect by the police. I've come to meet Brian McDonald, historian and author of Elephant Boys. So, Brian, you've got a personal connection with the Elephant and Castle Gang? Yes, I mean, through my uncles, uh, who were sort of leaders of the Elephant and Castle, leading up to World War I. They were bookmakers and uh, sort of tough guys and villains and smart Alex, that sort of family. I, my uncle Wag, who was the leader of the Elephant Boys, had a string of bookmakers pitches, which were illegal in those days. And if you want to be a bookmaker in South East London, you had to rent a pitch from him. It was a close-knit thing. And uh, membership was handed down from family to family so that, you know, children followed their fathers into the community. So how many people would be in this gang? Uh, oh, they were in the sort of gangs within a gang. You know, the Elven Culture Gang was one sort of great community, but you had warehouse thieves, smash and grab. And, uh, they all knew each other, you know, but they all did different sort of specialties. And, and did other gangs in other parts of London sort of hire out these guys? Yes, I mean, they, I think certainly at one time they hired out the muscle in the, when in the 50s, when I was a lad. I mean, they supported gangsters like Jack Spot, who was the premier gangster in, in London. You, you would have people in the gang who were good fighters. You would have to have, you know, to do some of the things that you were doing. George Cornish, who was a detective at the time, said of the Elephant and Castle gang that they were smart, well-dressed, well-educated, aristocrats of crime. Oh, really? But there was another branch of the Elephant gang, comprised of wives, daughters and girlfriends, an entire girl gang known as the 40 Thieves. This girl gang within the Elephant and Castle gang, it, how did that come about? They would first, in the early stages, they would carry burglars' tools for the men, you know, because if a man got caught, he didn't want to have these things found on him. So the girls would do that. They were also pickpockets, I think, some of them. I think it was with the early movies that come out and the Flapper Society and uh, watching films in the 1910s, 1920s of America and things like that, they want to be like it. And what do you get if you haven't got much money? You go out and you steal. So they would target West End shops and other shopping centres, and they would dress themselves up in these wonderful clothes. But one of the 40 thieves gained a formidable reputation. She was racy, she was stylish, and she was tough. Her name was Alice Diamond. Born in Southwark in 1886, Alice was the daughter of criminals. Her father had once pushed the head of the Lord Mayor's son through a plate glass window. By the age of 17, Alice had a criminal record for stealing from a hat shop in Oxford Street. Alice Diamond was born in Lambeth Workhouse Infirmary. When you 
read the history of it, it's more like a mortuary, the way they describe it, with stone-cold tables and things like that. So she didn't come into the world in the most pleasant circumstances. Right. And sometime during World War I, she was arrested for using another girl's card for, in a munitions factory. So she went in under a false identity. Why would she do that? Well, I would think probably to get explosives, because at this time, the process of blowing up safes was growing in London. It right. was something that had been introduced from America. American gangsters coming over here said, well, you're still opening safes with a tin opener sort of thing. No, this is what we use, Jellicanite, you know. So what kind of woman was Alice Diamond uh, to become the queen of this bunch? Well, I think principally she must have been a good organiser. Right. She would... There were thieves before, but when she came on the scene, she organised them into cells. So that there were four or five girls to a cell. They would target one shop, or they would hit the high street with three or four shops at a time. Detective Cornish described them as the cleverest of thieves. He said that there was nothing like them at all, you know. And they, they could walk into a shop and they could literally strip it. And Alice and her elephants were every bit as tough as the men. They said her punch was as strong as a man's, and the diamond rings covering her fingers caused maximum damage. Under Alice Diamond's reign, the gang prospered. She masterminded the largest shoplifting operation ever seen in this country. But it wouldn't be robbery that would be her downfall. By the late 80s, the four Arif brothers, Bakir, Mehmet, Dennis and Dogen, were the number one crime family in South London. They had enough money to indulge any passion. They could relax and enjoy the lifestyles of millionaires. Dogen had funded and managed his own football team. Fisher Athletic nearly made it into the fourth division, but that was their only indulgence. The Arif brothers kept grafting. In 1993, Dogen was convicted of being knowingly concerned in the fraudulent evasion of the prohibition of cannabis. The smuggling operation involved the shipment of 2.5 tonnes of cannabis with a street value in the United Kingdom of some 8.5 million pounds. Like all big outfits, the further the Aris distanced themselves from their operations, the less likely they were to be caught. But they were uh, an old-fashioned gang at heart. They liked to get their hands dirty. It was more of a matter of honour, and it told everyone else on the manor just who was in charge. The police didn't want another powerful crime family taking root in South London. So they set up a special squad with the sole purpose of targeting the Arifs. It was only a matter of time. In the 80s, the Arifs were kings. They were running everything. They seemed to be getting away with everything. Even when they got nicked, they got off. But, yeah, they, they really were becoming legendary figures. But then in late 1990, everything started to unravel. They decided to hold up a, a security van in Rygate in Surrey. Um, what they didn't realise was that one of their associates had tipped off the police, who in fact encouraged the entire robbery to still go ahead. On the 27th of November, two of the gang set off. They tracked the securicall van on its way to Rygate. The van was carrying large amounts of money to branches of Barclays Bank. Mehmet and Dennis Arif were on the job themselves, along with Dennis's brother-in-law and a hardened armed robber called Kenny Baker. They all tooled up with an assortment of guns. But unknown to them, the police were all on red alert. The Securicor van had become the bait, and the Arifs, the catch. In the centre of Rygate, the Securicor van pulled over and came to a halt. The security van has stopped. The man and woman security guard have got out uh, to go and get a coffee, and the Arifs and their friends swoop and they swoop with a vengeance. They were wearing um, Ronald Reagan masks, which must have been absolutely terrifying, because the police have turned up, because, of course, they knew about it. They were waiting. Um, they were there uh, planning to nick them all. This was in commuter belt town south of London. The police are uh, not going to let go. They're going to get this mob, if whatever happens. Yeah. And unfortunately, one of the other robbers, Baker, was shot dead. The Arras were nicked. 
Um, and this was a pivotal moment for them. It was a pivotal moment because it was the beginning of the decline of the Arifs, because it broke the family up in a way they'd never been broken up before. Mehmet and Dennis, together with their brother-in-law, Anthony Downer, were arrested. Kenny Baker lay dead. It was a massive dent in the Arif's gang and a major breakthrough for the police. But they could never have anticipated the violence which would soon follow. Alice Diamond was no stranger to violence. Standing at five foot eight, she was tall for the 1920s and her diamond studded fist could punch harder than a man's. Her all-girl gang, the 40 Thieves, were the most successful shoplifting operation ever. I've come to meet historian and author Lorraine Gammon. Her book, Gone Shopping, studies one of Diamond Annie's apprentices, Shirley Pitts. We're standing outside of one of their theatres of operation just off Oxford Street. How did you get to find out about the 40 Thieves? Well, what happened, I took down the life story of a professional thief. Nice to meet her here to take down, you know, chapters of in her life. And it turns out that she was trained, if you can use that word, by Alice Diamond. I think that what happened was that Shirley, you know, she was only 12, her dad had bought outfits for her, and they weren't right. And Alice offered to take her out shoplifting to get the right fit. And Shirley was just so impressed. Evidently, she was a very striking woman. You know, she had big fur coats, big hair, big makeup. And after the war... This, this is, is Alice. This is Alice, about 1947. You know, things were very dull. So I think Shirley was, um, you know, thrilled to be taken out by Alice and taught the trade. But tell me about Alice. What do you know about her? What kind of a character was she in the 20s? And why did she become queen of the 40 Thieves? Well, I I think what happened is she was from a crime family, and so you have to remember that poverty was part of the motivation. Like there wasn't the welfare state, people were poor, and they looked to find ways to make money. And shoplifting was something that Alice could do, and she had all the connections to make it work. So she could sell the clothes she stole, she could get lots of people to go with her and work with her. Right. And she was quite a forceful person, I gather. I do think that what was really interesting, they were like the first Avon ladies. They had these networks and they just sold crooked gear, not cosmetics, you know. And they networked through their friends and relatives, through the, through the women, actually. So the guys might have turned up in the pub and made the deal with Alice. Once she'd gone to meet, you know, the wives and girlfriends, then they had a, a network set up almost. So if you have a gang who are going out every day, I mean, the amounts are staggering, really, what a very small group yeah. of prolific offenders can actually steal. And I think what is... What is interesting and, and somewhat exciting about this gang is that they're not stealing to make money to buy drugs or anything. They are stealing to look more glamorous and to live better and, uh, and, and to maybe raise their social status. I think that's absolutely right. With Shirley's account, you know, she talked about seeing for the first time the toilets in Selfridges. You know, there she is in her uh, schoolgirl's outfit with, you know, straw bloater as a decoy so the 40 Thieves can try clothes on her. And she finally goes to the toilet and she said it was wonderful. It was all glass and beautiful soap and she wanted to live like that. So, yeah, they were aspirational, absolutely. Just like Fagin, you know, corrupted a network, Alice was able to do that too, but she was very organised and I think that we shouldn't underestimate the way she managed to mobilise them, almost like a female general. Sort of getting them on time, getting them in the car, making sure the, the boot was packed to sufficient amounts. Right. The Elephant Boys saw her as the perfect candidate to lead their female army of shoplifters. In 1916, aged 20, Alice Diamond became queen of the 40 Thieves and would transform them. Dressed in specially tailored clothes complete with hidden pockets, Diamond and her crew raided some of the West End's biggest stores. Debenhams, D.H. Evans, Selfridges and Whiteley's. Diamond's girls dressed smart. They never wore any stolen goods and they gave the impression they were cut from finer cloth. But underneath their glamorous outfits were hidden surprises. Their jackets had deep inside pockets to contain plundered goods. Tailored cummerbunds, muffs, skirts, and even hats sewn with hidden pockets. One key innovation was to wear extra voluminous knickers to hide their ill-gotten gains. 
And they had a name for the knickers. Yeah, they? they were called hoisting knickers, like from to hoist. And so that's how they got the name the oysters. But that's what I like, the, because ho hoister becomes oyster if you drop the H. That's, the oyster knickers is great. <laughs> I love that. I'm sure we could make them now. They like to steal small, exclusive things. Then there was lingerie, silk, designer clothes, furs, leather goods. It all just vanished. How would they do a raid on, say, one of the shops here? Well, what would happen? They'd arrive probably by car and park somewhere sneaky. And the car was very important. It needed a big boot so they could go backwards and forwards and load up. And they would all carry identical type bags and gradually go in the shops one by one. The first two would start loading the gear. The next person to come in would swap the bag and take the others out. And so there's only one chance of one person being arrested, while the others gradually moved around them. And sometimes they'd create a distraction, so they'd pretend to faint or if they were taken ill, and then cause a big havoc in the, in the store. And so people were looking at the wrong thing. But actually, a lot, a lot of the technique was about rolling the stuff very small and packing it in. And you, you have to remember, nowadays, we have very different types of technology. We have CCTV. TV, yeah. we have all sorts of detection networks. Then cool, cool. it was a free-for-all. And so the women were very good at, you know, in smaller places, crowding the place. So if it was the bag section of Selfridges, if you've got 14 people in there and only two are stealing, that's right. quite a nice distraction. All that's right. why they were called the 40 Thieves, because there was a lot of them. But it wasn't robbery that would be Alice's downfall. In 1925, she took a gang to carry out a brutal attack on a male gang member she'd fallen out with. And this time, events would overtake her. 27th of November, 1990, a gang, including Dennis and Mehmet Arif, had ambushed a Securicor van that had pulled up on a garage forecourt in Reigate, Surrey. But the police had ambushed them, arresting three of the gang and leaving one of them, Kenny Baker, dead. Mehmet Arif pleaded guilty. Dennis and Mehmet were jailed for many years. The Arifs look weakened, but the infractions between other rival gangs, the Brindles and the Dailies, and involving another member of the Arif family, began. The first incident kicked off in August 1990 when two associates of the Brindles threatened rival John Daly in the Queen Elizabeth pub in Woolworth. Now the Arifs joined in. They now set upon the Brindles. Cousin of Dogan Arif, drug dealer known as Turkish Abbey, lured a friend of the Brindles into a club basement and shot him. The tit-for-tat killings went on. Turkish Abbey became the next target. In March 1991, he walked with his bull terrier into the William Hill betting shop in Woolworth. A gunman was waiting for him. The gunman then squeezed off two rounds from his 9mm Browning. Abby pleaded with him not to kill him. He then grabbed the man from the shop, using him as a human shield, dragged him outside. He was shot again, this time in the back. Turkish Abbey staggered 400 yards to a friend's house on the King's Lake estate, where he's alleged to have whispered the names of his killers. He died shortly afterwards in hospital. Abbey was like a son to the head of the Arif family. Revenge would be swift. Shortly afterwards, a well-known face was shot at the Arif's connoisseur club. He refused to say who had shot him, and apparently, even while he was in hospital, as he spewed up the bullet that had grounded him, he re-swallowed it to prevent any forensic tests. Such was the fear that the Arif spread across the manor. The police now moved in on Bakir Arif, the Duke. They believed Bakir's business was a front to supply heroin, and at last, they had the evidence. In 1999, tape conversations and photographs from their surveillance brought about a conviction of conspiracy to supply heroin worth 12 million pounds. Becky Arif, then 46 years old, was given 23 years. The downfall of Alice Diamond and her 40 thieves was also coming. Fractures began to open in the gang, 
and a squabble between two girls would escalate into a full-scale fight, spelling disaster for them. On the evening of the 19th of December 1925, here at the site of the old Canterbury Social Club, two of Alice Diamond's 40 thieves, Mari Jackson and Bertha Tappenden, started to drunkenly throw insults at one another. Mari Jackson attacked Tappenden with a broken wine glass. It cut her face. And then Jackson's father, Bill Britton, joined in and punched Bertha. So, Brian, we're on the cut at the moment where the, uh, where the argument first started. Yes. What started this row? Um, it was between two girls, Mari, Mari Jackson and uh, Bertha Tappenden. Did it happen in the street or...? No, inside the club. Inside the club. They got a row and there's... Uh, Bertha Tappenden said at one stage, Mari called me a bad name. Her father grew up, threw a glass of stout over me and uh, she was hit in the face with a flying glass. Um, and Mari bit her finger. <laughs> so, and there was quite a brawl going on. But this doesn't seem the sort of split or brawl that would lead to such a riot. There must have been something else there going on. There must be something else there. I mean, the girls all knew each other and they all had... Were they their convictions? Many of them were linked together through their convictions, so they, they were all part of the same group. Because what made the Elephant Gang so strong was the fact that they were there were so many of them, and they were such a tight knitted That's group. That's right. I, they, they, it was fairly unusual that, that sort of trouble amongst themselves. They usually would have fights with other people, with other communities, but not amongst themselves. But this certainly led to Alice's downfall, really. Didn't it? Well, it, it did because the things simmered, and they they. It was a few nights later, back in the same club, where the girls were drinking all night, up till about midnight. And then they left. And then when they left with uh, some of the men, they gathered up bottles and glasses and anything they could lay their hands on and started to march along the cut towards where Mari Jackson and her family lived. Alice Diamond led the drunken rabble to attack Mari Jackson's house, where she lived with her mother, Mary and her father, Bill Britton. So, so just talk me through it, Brian. What happened when they got here? Well, the house was about here. Um, 30, 40, maybe more people crowded in this narrow street, all armed with bottles, bricks, all well bevied. But there would have been a lot of hangers on as well at the same time. But the house disintegrated in a way. All of the windows were smashed. Mari Jackson was asleep upstairs and said she was awoken by gunshots. She, oh. she heard pistol shots. Just her family living in this house? Just her family living on the two storeys. The gang broke open the door, and Bill Britton and his wife, Mary, were on the other side of the door trying to keep it shut. And, and who uh, led the gang? Well, oh, was it Alice? Uh, Alice Diamond and Maggie Hughes right. and Gertrude Scully, right. yes. And I think it was the men that were trying to force the door open. And Britton was the other side, and his wife trying to keep it shut. Well, they couldn't. I mean, the crowd just barged in and got inside. Bill Britt ran upstairs. I mean, well, he was chased from room to room and he was being slashed out with knives and maybe razors. His face was badly cut. His son, who was only 15 years of age, intervened and he was knocked down. And they had life preservers, didn't they? They had life preservers. I mean, so called, of course, because they knocked somebody out without killing them. So it was called a life preserver. This is, could be a rubber cosh, it could be anything. It was usually a chair leg or something like that. It could be anything or something they'd taken to the pub. The target seems to have been Bill Britton. That's, that's who they were after. Mari tried to rescue her father, one of the men, which was George Hughes, who was the brother-in-law of Maggie Hughes, um, had a gun, and he pointed it in her face and she collapsed. How did it come to an end? Well, the police were beginning to arrive. Bill Britton apparently had come out of the house or been led out of the house. His face was a mass of blood. It required 25 stitches or more to repair the damage. What about Alice? Alice got away. They all got away, but Mari Jackson gave names of people who were involved to the police. And was there a sense with this that the, the 40 thieves had been brought down? Yes. I mean, the, the police believed that they had cracked the gang at that time. They'd arrested Alice Diamond, who was definitely the queen of the 40 thieves at that time, and Maggie Hughes, who was a prolific thief and one of the leaders of the gang, and others. Alice Diamond, 28, of 99 Hales Buildings, Elephant and Castle, along with eight others, appeared in court. 
The prosecution stated that only the intervention of the police prevented the nine accused from being charged with murder. The future of the 40 thieves now hung in the balance. By the year 2000, three of the Arif gang were in jail. Burkir, the Duke, for 23 years, was trying to flood the streets with heroin. Mehmet and Dennis, only halfway through their sentences for the security van raid in 1990. But even inside Parkhurst, the Arif brothers still wielded their power. So we've got Dennis and Mehmet both went to Parkhurst, and also Duggan was put away. What was life like for them in there? Well, Dennis and Mehmet, when they got to Parkhurst, um a new world opened up for them in a sense. They were treated with a great trepidation initially and of course in Parkhurst were some of the real criminal legends of that time including the great train robbers yeah. um, and later the Brinks mat robbers etc and they were running everything mm. through a combination of the fear factor and money because one mustn't forget the Arifs had a lot of money you know yeah. most of the money that they stole was never recovered and it was being reinvested all the time. So they used all of that, all of their resources, and they took it inside prison. The, one of the fallacies of, of prison is that for some reason you can't get hold of your money. Of course you can get hold of your money, or people can be paid outside on your behalf for services you obtain or render inside prison. And both the Arifs who were in Parkhurst were reveling in this. I'm not saying that any of these staff members at Parkhurst were doing anything wrong, but the power and influence of the Arabs spread its tentacles across the whole block and probably throughout the whole of Parkhurst. Everyone knew they had money. Uh, they'd reinvested a lot of the money they got from drugs and robbery into legitimate businesses. Uh, so they were wealthy. And when people know you've got money in prison, you can get what you want. Alice Diamond and some of her elephants would soon have their own taste of prison. In court, they all pleaded not guilty. Alice Diamond claimed she was with her married sister all day on the night in question. Her father supported her alibi. But Alice and many of the 40 thieves were sentenced to 18 months in prison with hard labor. We know what happened to Alice. We know how, with the, with the after the riot, that she was in prison for a while. But then she came back out and continued with the Forty Thieves. What what do you, what happened to really break that network up? Well, I think that you know after the post-war period, there were different opportunities, and the sort of bombed housing situation meant lots of people moved away. And I, I suppose the criminal networks continued, but they weren't all located in the same place because most of them were, wanted better bathrooms and wanted to go to the new housings that would offer in dis different places. After the Second World War, with its most notorious members either dead or imprisoned, the influence of the elephants and the 40 thieves was wearing thin. Security and department stores had been improved, shoplifting became riskier, Gentrification saw an end to the gangsters' stomping grounds. Remaining gang members moved out to the suburbs. It was the end of an era. But another would soon begin. A new age of gangs was just around the corner. Alice Diamond passed on her skills to create the next generation of thieves. Alice Diamond suited Shirley Pitts, the up-and-coming future queen of the 40 Thieves, who was the queen in the 1950s. Shirley Pitts. Shirley Pitts, who was a descendant from the Pitts family, who were one of the sort of gangs involved around the Elephant Castle. What happened to but Alice? Alice died in about 1952. Respectably? Yes, uh, she died uh, in Lambeth, but according to one of her family, she'd lost the use of both arms. Um, her sister died from multiple sclerosis, I don't know if that runs in families, but it's quite possible that Alice had that at that time. What a thing for a shoplifter to it's, lose. It's ironic, yeah. Yeah. So although Alice Diamond had gone, her skills lived on with the new leader of the gang, Shirley Pitts. She started off by playing the part of an innocent schoolgirl. They told her not to speak, but they get her in a perfect, you know, private schoolgirl's uniform with straw bloater. And the point was to march her around and pretend to try on 
dresses against her, and as they put the hanger against her, that concealed their hands, and they were loading the bag up, and they, they would be teasing her and, you know, conjoling her to wear these things. So I imagine that they had voices they could use. These, these, are, these are great actresses. Oh, absolutely, and Shirley always could do the madam. And she described Alice as having plenty of giver. Do you know that phrase? No. Well, giver is about having a lot of front and being very plucky, being sort of not scared. And she loved that they had the guy, and I think she emulated that in her own career. When Shirley died, I mean, because things had moved on, she was buried in a frock that they'd stolen from Harrods, and the, the, the flowers on the side of the hearse that went past had gone shopping. I mean... That's priceless. Times moved on also for the Arifs. Some of them had a stab at going straight. When I came here 12 years ago to meet Doug and Arif, this particular building was a slot machine factory. I mean, they're not called one-armed bandits for nothing. Yeah. And it was a thriving business. There were loads of people working here when I came in here. Uh, Doug and took me into his office. It was beautifully furnished. He was smoking a cigar. He seemed like a man without a problem in the world. But what's interesting is that it's still here, the building. But more interesting than all of that was Duggan was very proud of the fact there was no cul-de-sac sign at the end of the road telling you it was a dead end. I noticed that as we drove in. Yeah, he loved that. He used to say people would drive down here and they didn't even realise it was a dead end and that was the way he liked it because it meant he had them trapped. So what about now? Are they around still or is it all gone quiet? They're all out of prison now. Uh, it hasn't gone quiet in the real sense but they've reinvested a lot of their funds into other businesses. Two of them, at least, are now based back in northern Cyprus, where the family came from originally. Uh, and they've even dipped their toes into things such as timeshare resorts in northern Cyprus. Uh, and they have very strong connections still and businesses on the mainland of Turkey. There's no doubt that beneath the surface, just round here, they have some influence, yeah. but it's nowhere near the level it used to be. It's incredible to think that just 30 to 40 years ago, there were vast areas of London controlled by four brothers. Yeah. And now we're talking about little satellite criminal gangs operating in streets, just streets alone, not, not even boroughs. Um, and they are not likely to ever spread their wings in the same way that the Arabs or any of the others, like the Richardsons and the Crays, did before them. Violent, armed and dangerous, the Arabs would take on an armed robbery as well as running a massive drugs importation business. Unlike today's gangland, fractured by postcode territories and paranoia and division, the Arifs were the last of the old-style London gangsters. They aimed big, they worked as a group, people knew who they were, and they feared them. 